So then let's basically then finish up divergence-based methods. So the, the outline here is we want to talk about the fraction alpha of adaptive substitutions. We can estimate that using mcdonald kreitman type approaches, estimate that using maximum likelihood. I'll kind of go over the empirical results. We'll then talk about a method called Poisson random fields, and that's kind of using mcdonald kreitman data, polymorphism divergence, um, replacement silent data, using maximum likelihood. And then I'll conclude by basically trying to connect all these parameters. We've talked about omega, the rate of adapt, the, the ratio of, uh, of, of, of of synonymous versus non-synonymous substitutions. We'll talk about alpha. I'll show you how you connect, connect all these, because these different methods estimate slightly different things. So here are three of the people that have done a lot of the work on estimation of fraction of random effects. Brian was the one that originally came with it, and Adam Airwalker and Peter Keatley and did a lot of work in that as well. There's also some interesting quantitative genetics here. So Brian is, is a very well-known evolutionary biologist. <laughs> He's a fellow of the Royal Society. He's married to Deborah, who's a very well-known uh, botanist, also in the Royal Society. And their daughter is Jane. And Jane has actually worked with Adam. And so a lot of the Charles Worth and Airwalker papers are kind of are basically the result of this interaction here. So that's give you a little bit of the connections here. So let's think about what we're trying to get at. And we've talked about how we can take McDonald Kreitman data and estimate the excessive number of substitutions. So if the neutrality ratio is less than one, that means I've got more substitutions relative to polymorphisms than I expect from that new ratio for silent sites. So we can basically take that expected value and look at the actual value minus that expected value and get the number of adaptive substitutions. So basically, uh, uh, you, this is the results you end up getting this is the value you expect to get. That's the number of adaptive substitutions given the divergence and polymorphism data. Then you get the polymorphism data for, for the, the non-synonymous. So here is the neutral expectation. There is the actual number that you observe. And this difference then is basically the excess number of substitutions. If you look at the ratio of this excess number to the total number, what you end up getting is that's just simply one minus the neutrality index. So we had this neutrality index measure, which basically gave you some idea of if you have an excess number of polymorphisms or excess substitutions, if the neutrality index is less than one, you've got more substitutions, and one minus neutrality index gives you the fraction of those substitutions which are adapted. So for example, if you look at non-coding regions on the X chromosome, take the data from example 10.6, you do the neutrality index, and you get an alpha value of about 10%. So about 10% of the substitutions in non-coding regions in Drosophila from this method are excessive, and therefore you can think of them as adaptive. Um, if you remove singletons, remember singletons inflates the polymorphism ratio. If you remove singletons, that number jumps up to 24%. So obviously there's a delicacy in terms of how you treat the data, in terms of what you estimate your adaptive fractions to be. But the bottom line is, in these non-coding regions, between 10 and 25% of all substitutions are probably adaptive. You can also, uh, similar uh, analysis done to mouse, has shown that about 10% of the substitutions in up and downstream regions around protein coding gene are also probably advantageous. Again, we call them advantageous because there's an excess number so there are a lot of different ways we could estimate this excess number. One immediate concern is if we go gene by gene, we have very little power. So suppose the adaptive substitution is 20%. That means if you have four replacements, you expect to see, if you expect four replacements, you're actually going to see five. Distinguishing four from five is a very weak signal. So if you try to do alpha for each individual gene, it's very noisy, very uneven. So what people typically do is they amalgamate all the data together and try to get a single signal over all the data. There are lots of different ways you can combine data. So the notation here of a bar means I'm taking the average over my entire sample of the synonymous divergence. 
the average over all my sample of the adaptive divergence, the average over all my sample of the adaptive, sorry, of the, of the uh, uh, non-synonymous polymorphisms, and my average over all my sample of my synonymous polymorphisms. And this is phase estimator, and it gives you one way then over not just one gene, but over a number of genes to try to get a good idea of what that signal is. So we call this a McDonald Kreitman type estimator. Why? It uses the four things in McDonald Kreitman data divergence and polymorphism. So there are a lot of different ways people have taken this data and trying to, to get improved estimators. So this is an average over a number of loci, but there's some concerns with this. The first concern is if you basically take the expected value of this ratio, what you end up getting is you estimate alpha, but you also have then the variance in alpha. So if you have a variance in the alpha rates over genes, you get an inflated estimate. A broader issue, you take the other component, the ratio of the two polymorphisms, what you get is this expression here, and the key feature is this covariance between the neutral mutation rate and this quantity here, which is the function of the affected population size. So if your neutral mutation rate, that is effectively neutral mutation rate, declines as your population size gets bigger, you get a positive covariance, you inflate that, and again, you get biased estimates. The reasons to suspect this happens as your affected population size gets larger, a smaller fraction of your variants become effectively neutral. So one correction that's been proposed for that, uh, uh, Airwalker and Smith, is now this. So once again, we're simply taking the average divergence over synonymous divided by the average divergence over um, uh, non-synonymous, but now we're taking the average. So for each gene, we compute a, a non-synonymous over synonymous plus one, and take the average of that. So the bar is the average over this thing. That has much better features than the Faye estimate, and in fact, now the only error is basically this estimates alpha bar, then plus the variance among sites in this. So this is very su substantial. You still have quite a bit of an overestimation. There are additional versions, for example, um, Airwalker, this is the latest version they're using. And again, you're saying we're taking all the data and we're trying to combine it in ways that make the most sense. So this is currently the, the, the most widely used McDonald Crichton base estimator for the fraction of adaptive sites. And you read the chapter to find out the different reasons for these. Areas. The bottom line, the big picture here is we can use McDonald Crichton data to make estimates of the adaptive fraction of protein coding sites. Yeah. Well, yeah, I didn't mention that actually. That's why I didn't go, go over it. But the Ewell Simpson effect basically says, and the classic case was a lawsuit brought against Berkeley. And what happens at Berkeley was that they noticed that um, women had a higher rejection rate than men. Statistically significantly different. And so a lawsuit was filed. Then they drilled down and looked at the data, and they found that women actually had a higher acceptance rates than men. It was men were applying to a larger number of programs. And the programs that men were applying to more than women were programs with higher acceptance rates. So the women were applying to some of the most difficult programs to get into and higher, higher success acceptance rates than men, but that signal was swamped by the fact that a lot more men were applying to other programs and had a higher rate. So the individual values are different from the amalgamate values. And that thing broadly is called the Yule Simpson effect. And this is one way to kind of get around the fact that Individual signals may give you a different view than when you amalgamate the signals. It's the same thing. Yeah, that's a, the Yule Simpson has several several different names to it. So one of the big issues. Let's just go back to the river. All these things basically come out in a sense from the neutrality index. And one issue with the neutrality index, which is basically the ratio of, 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 of non-synonymous polymorphisms to non-synonymous divergence, is if I have weakly deleterious alleles, they will inflate the, faction, the fraction of non-synonymous alleles which are segregating, but they never get fixed. So basically, what, what I'm looking at is slightly different values of mu 
for the polymorphism data and for the fixed data. So one of the big concerns is how do I adjust for that? And one way we mentioned was simply remove singletons. That's kind of ad hoc. And singletons means if I have a polymorphic sample and I've got one segregating site, there's only a single copy, I remove it and I compute the polymorphism in the absence of that copy. That always makes the neutrality index smaller, which makes alpha bigger, but how do you then in a reasonable fashion is kind of unclear. So um, one approach was to, quote, count only common polymorphisms for PA and PS. What the hell does that mean? What's common? What's the threshold, right? Um, and this is great. So, so uh, Jane Charlesworth and, and Airwalker said, this approach is, quote, better than doing nothing, <laughs> but it still tends to give you downward bias estimates unless the true A is fairly substantial. So the, the way people tried to get around these then is to basically use likelihood-based models. But there's a, a recent proposal that was made from Dimitri Petrov's group in Stanford, which is actually kind of clever. And that is, I like approaches that take a test statistic and then modify it and iteratively use it on the data. And their approach was, all these adjusted estimators, what they do is they take a certain uh, allele frequency, and if your alleles are below that allele frequency, you don't count them as polymorphic. Well, what about if instead of taking a single value, you take a series of values and do a regression? So let's imagine I've got some estimator. So for example, the estimator could simply be this. And what I do is that whenever an allele is, uh, is in our sample below some frequency, I don't count it in the polymorphic data. So for example, if x equals 0.05, it means I compute this estimate where any allele in either replacement or silent, if its frequency is less than 5%, I don't include it, I compute this on the basis of that. Then I go, for example, to 7% or 10% or 1%. And so I get a series of estimates there that, that this doesn't change, but as I change my threshold, I basically change what are put in here. So obviously, as my, th my cutoff threshold gets larger, both these values get smaller. And so what they suggested was what you want to basically then do is fit a regression. And their estimate basically is this. You uh, take the, the alpha value and you then fit it with this regression here. So basically, here's the observed value for your statistic. Let's say at 5%, that's a data point and then x equal 5, then take this value for x equal 10%, that's data point, x equal 10, and simply fit this with an exponential regression. Then what you do when you fit that regression, you then ask what the asymptotic value is. What happens if I basically threw out all the data? And you plug in x equal 1, that then is your estimate. So you fit this regression, and you then simply take this as your estimate, and it's a nice, clean way to get around this issue, what's that critical threshold and critical cutoff? This is relatively recent, but it seems to be a nice way to handle things. The other approach is you can use likelihood estimators. And the idea is you can build a model that accounts for a certain fraction of the mutations being deleterious and estimate that fraction by assuming, for example, a gamma and estimating the mean of that gamma. And so there's a bunch of likelihood approaches that do this and Adam and, and, and Peter were involved with a lot of these. And so that's another way to get around it. So you can use McDonald Kreitman or likelihood estimators. Likelihood estimators try to basically figure out the effective population size and the average strength against the deleterious mutation and use those to adjust. So we can then take a bunch of estimates and ask the question how common are adaptive substitutions? based upon these methods, which, as you point out, aren't perfect. So here is the punchline. Here's a whole bunch of data. So you can see the method, likelihood, which means you basically fit a model that tries to adjust for deleterious alleles by figuring out what the effective population size and what their average frequency is. And the book talks about how you do that. Or you have mcdonald kreitman estimates. What you see here is that they're... Um, so look at mouse, for the sequence of genes they looked at, 
the adaptive rate was 60%. Rabbit, 60%. Chickens. Uh, what you'll notice here, the nice thing is melanogaster, they're pretty common, uh, pretty similar using different methods. One McDonald Kreitman and three different likelihood methods. Um, and if you go down here to humans, you get something interesting. Zero. How do you get an estimate of zero? Well, if your neutrality index is bigger than one, one minus that is alpha, you get a negative alpha, you truncate that at zero. There are, in humans, there are, oh, sorry, humans on the other side. Yeah, here we are. Um, yeah, so, uh, so how do you get it in, in Drosophila melanda in the, the autosomal genes? Well, here basically, you've got too many, um, slightly, you've got too many uh, non synonymous polymorphisms. And therefore, your neutrality index is positive. A positive neutrality index means alpha is negative, and so you truncate it at that. So if you look at humans, here we are. So here's the McDonald Cartman estimate. There are other estimates that vary quite a bit. And um, people had asked the question, as you get species with what we assume are larger affected population sizes, do you tend to get higher alpha values? The answer is there's no obvious, obvious trend there. Let me make one more point here. And here's a nice study, and the reference is in the book. So what they did is this is a series of different plants. So Hawaiian silver swords, these are two sunflowers. That's uh, aspen, corn, and sorghum, rice, strypto. I'm not sure what strypto is. And then uh, one of the, the uh, uh, Arabidopsis, uh, uh, the, the Arabidopsis relative. What they're doing here is basically these are the estimates and confidence intervals on alpha. And what you see basically is the only one where you've got significantly positive alpha is in this sunflower comparison here. Now the reason that's interesting is that sunflower comparison there looks at these two sunflower species and uses that population for polymorphism. When you look at these two sunflower species and use this population for polymorphism, you don't see an effect. So the polymorphic standard you use can dramatically change things. So these estimates are fun and they're interesting and they have some value, but you have to treat them with a little grain of salt. The other one that's interesting is, let's look up here, those are the Hawaiian silver swords. So those of you who don't know the Hawaiian silver sword alliance is a really cool thing. You basically had this kind of average looking sort of crappy tarweed plant that came over and it radiated dramatically on Hawaii. So you get these incredibly divergent um, uh, phenotypes, like for example, a little tiny shrub in a big tree. So you get this incredible morphological divergence in a very short amount of time. And yet, if you look at a whole bunch of genes in there, there's not a lot of strong signal for adaptive substitutions in coding region genes. What's going on? Well, an obvious explanation of what's going on is a lot of evolution is not done by adaptive substitutions that give you new amino acid sequences. A lot of evolution is probably done by fine-tuning regulation. So for example, it could be it was between this morphology and that morphology isn't any difference in the protein coding genes, but rather differences in timing. So for example, you've got a growth, uh, a stem elongation gene. You suppress it here. You keep it on much longer in there. You wouldn't at all change the actual function of the gene, but just by timing and regulation, you can change it really rather dramatically. So the other feature is all these estimates here are essentially all based upon using protein coding sequences. And as we mentioned, we talked about a lot of the conserved DNA, in fact, in humans, the majority of conserved DNA, it's outside of protein coding regions. Protein coding regions may give you a biased picture for what's going on in terms of adaptive evolution across the entire morphology. Now they're interesting if you look at them by protein by protein, but there could be a lot more adaptive evolution that's going on. So maybe the adaptive evolution rates, that is when a substitution occurs, maybe it's more likely to be adaptive in a non-coding region than a coding region. We simply don't know. So questions about the fraction of adaptive substitutions. Again, there's a lot of details and all the original references and stuff you can find, find in the books or, or track it down from here. So 
But the next fun question is, how often do adaptive substitutions occur? What is lambda? The rate of adaptive substitution per site per time. We gave a couple of examples a few lectures ago when we talked about sweeps, many common or many rare. The adaptive substitution basically is the commonness of sweeps times the flexion coefficient. So how can we separate those? Well, a nice way to separate those, this is a, a Alvafado's Peter's estimate, and it's simply, you basically take the um, uh, observed number of substitutions, D, divide it by number of sites to get a substitution rate per site, multiply that, so this is substitution rate per site, this is divided by the time, so, sorry, this is yeah, yeah, substitutions, fraction substitutions by site, this is time, you simply then multiply that by your estimate of alpha, and then this thing here gives you the fraction of adaptive substitutions as a function of time, and it gives you a clean estimate of rate. So to get that, you have to basically estimate alpha because you can observe the actual number of replacement substitutions from the data. So that's one way where you can have estimates of the rate of adaptive substitution. One question is, how do you get time? You can get time from molecular data. You can also get time from the polymorphism data. This isn't quite as clean, but it's, uh, that is, the molecular data can give you sharper estimates on it. But so you can basically, just from the polymorphic data alone, from McDonald Kreitman data, then get an estimate for the rate of adaptive substitutions. And again, I want to stress is this is based upon structural changes, changes that give you a different amino acid, hence replacements. You may have a lot higher rates of evolution at sites which give you regulatory changes. You just don't have a feeling yet. And part of that is we tend to focus on protein coding regions because we can find them in a genome sequence and we have some idea about when a change occurs. Is it a radical change? That is, does it change the charge of the amino acid? Or something about its shape? We are not very good at finding general regulatory sites. We know a couple of boxes, but not good about general regulatory sites. We also don't have a good feeling if you change a nucleotide, what effect does that have? So, go through some example here. If you look at uh, the, the estimated uh, divergence rates between humans and chimpanzees per site is this, divergence time about 7 million years. If you take a 10% value, which is kind of an average value for the alphas here for humans, if you take that, then what you get is the uh, rate of adaptive substitutions per site per year is this. If you take a generation time of about 25 years, then you get a per site per generation rate of about 10 to the minus 12. If you want to compare that, so X chromosome data comparing melanogaster and simulans, that similar per site per generation value is down here at 10 to the minus 10, so basically two orders of magnitude. I think it's actually a factor 12 higher. So you can, I'm not saying that these estimates are bulletproof and are extremely tight, but this is the type of logic you can go through to take sequence data and make estimators of these really interesting things, such as the rate of adaptive evolution. So when I showed you that summary slide from chapter eight on sweeps, where some of those had values of lambda, this is the approach that people use to compute those values of lambda for this. So that's how we can take McDonald Kreitman data and basically turn it into estimates of the fraction of adaptive substitutions and therefore into estimates of the rate of adaptive substitutions. The big concern is how do we adjust for the fact that our polymorphism data in advantageous sites is probably overestimated by the fact we've got weakly deleterious. We've gone through a couple of methods here, but the bottom line is it's still an evolving area about how people adjust for that. So questions or comments on that? How many people have seen the notion of fraction adaptive substitutions before? Okay. Sure. Sure. 
So there's a good point. So the, the, the way, so there's two issues. Number one, we want to get an estimated value. That's an average value. And if you've got error in that average value, if it's a linear estimator, the error usually doesn't enter. If it's a quadratic estimator, the variance of that error enters. Because we're taking an expectation, so expectation of x plus error is, is basically expectation of x. Where it comes in is the uncertainty involved in this. And so usually when people are trying to get accurate estimates of the uncertainty, they use a Bayesian framework, so they estimate everything at once. And therefore, you can use something in Bayes called marginal posteriors, which are, I basically integrate everything else and ask what's the uncertainty in this estimate, given I've accounted for all the other errors. So if you want to worry about putting standard errors on here, what you do is you put these in a Bayesian framework, and then what you do is when you have a Markov chain, your MCMC method is generating these estimates, what you simply do is you simply take that one column for your estimate and compute its variance. That's the same as computing a marginal posterior because your Markov chain is done. And that's talked a bit about, pardon me? Yeah, and we talk about that in appendix, appendix two and three, about these marginal posteriors. Other? And we'll see Bayes again in a second. We talk about Poisson random fields. So mcdonald Kreitman methods are basically taking the observed data counts and doing simple statistics on them. That idea was expanded by Stan Sawyer and Dan Hartle when they're both at WASU. Unfortunately, Stan passed away a couple of years ago. To this idea of a Poisson random field. And in a Poisson random field, it takes the same data, but it estimates different things. So in a mcdonald kreitman approach, what I can do is I can estimate the excess number of substitutions and therefore estimate alpha, the fraction of the excess divided by the total. We assume those are adapted. In a Poisson random field approach, by the way, how many people have heard of Poisson random field besides those at Cornell? Okay, so um, we basically estimate the scaled mutation rate, the scaled strength of selection, and then compute the fraction of deleterious, neutral, and advantageous mutations. So this model was originally given in a rather basic form, and people have modified it since then. There's a lot of details here. I'm gonna, gonna show you a couple of equations, don't get freaked out. I'm gonna give you the overall picture, and the book develops it a bit more, a bit more cleanly. So the idea is basically this. So I have four counts, synonymous polymorphisms, synonymous divergences, non-synonymous polymorphisms, non-synonymous divergences, and basically those I can write as a function of four parameters. Parameter number one, four NE mu for non-synonymous, four NE mu for synonymous, tau is a scaled divergence measure over time, and the new one here is gamma. And the new thing about gamma, gamma is 2NES. And the original model, they assumed that each mutation that arose that was non synonymous had the same selection coefficient, and gamma is basically a measure of that. So the nice thing about this feature, if those on average were negative, you could actually estimate them. Modifications of these basically have taken the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 this model here and a lot of distribution effects. We'll talk about those in a second. So you end up getting these expressions. The expected value for the number of silent sites is those are sample sizes. That's the unknown parameter tau for time. This is the parameter for basically um, the uh, 4 NE mu S. Same, you can also get an expression. So same parameter for polymorphism. Then the expression for divergence and polymorphism with um, non synonymous sites is a bit more involved because basically what these are taking into account are fixation probabilities and equilibrium frequencies. But the key part here is these are simply a function of this selection parameter here, 2NE mu, and this uh, uh, scaled mutation rate. So we've got one, two mutation rates, a time, and then this new parameter gamma, which is the strength of selection. The Poisson random field model takes McDonald-Kreitman data, four data points, and estimates four things from it. 
Now, the good slash bad news is I've got four unknowns, four observations. I can estimate them. Unfortunately, I can't say anything about their precision. This is four unknowns and four data points. I estimate them with complete precision. So the key feature here, I've been nice here and underlined this for you, right? Several people have commented it's hard to pick out things in the slide. I'll be working on that a little bit later when I reiterate those. But the key idea is that MK and Poisson random fields, the similarity is they use the exact same data. The four variables in that table, the two polymorphism counts, the two divergent counts. The difference, though, is McDonald Kreitman makes no assumptions about the nature of strength of selection, but instead estimates F, the reduction in the effect of the neutral mutation rate, we just never use that, and alpha, the fraction of replacements that are adapted. The Poisson random field estimates these two mutational parameters, and it also then estimates this average strength of selection. So how do we connect this average strength of selection with this fraction of replacement size. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But the idea is we're taking the same data and estimating different sort of things. So the original model basically looks like this. Here are the count data, and the count data basically, that's the form for Poisson. So people have all seen the Poisson distribution. What was the original application of the Poisson distribution? in Prussian army, number of Prussian military people killed each year by being kicked in the head by their horse. It's a discrete number, 0, 1, 2, 3. On average, 1.3 Prussians were killed each year, so you compute the chance of none being killed, one being killed, two being killed, etc. So um, it's amazing how many ideas in math trace back to warfare. So for example, the, um, the Chlusky decomposition, you may have heard about it, was actually invented by a French military artillery officer. So there are all these interesting, and of course, all of probability theory basically derives from gambling. So this is the likelihood function. So basically, it's complicated, but it's not. So what this basically says is that if this is my unknown parameter, x is my data, in a likelihood model, what I do is I plug in my data, then I find the unknown parameter that maximizes that. In this case, I've got four types of data, the four counts. I've got four unknown parameters. I've got a likelihood surface in four dimensions. I scan over that. You have some method to search it, and therefore get the values for theta A, theta S, tau, and gamma that best fit the data. That's the whole idea behind this Poisson random field model. And so the initial model was very crude. One selective effect for replacement genes, gamma. Subsequent variations said, well, let's do this. Let's break it down just like the codon models. There's some probability, so a mixture of being adaptive, deleterious, uh, or neutral, and then some values with those. And the way you can construct these models, you can basically average information over multiple sites, and therefore get the degrees of freedom to estimate that. And um, in uh, Rasmus Nelson applied this data to 50 human genes. This was a bias set of human genes. These were genes chosen a priori because there was prior evidence from other methods of strong possible selection. The resulting estimators were the probability of being deleterious was about 75.75, and among those that were deleterious, the average strength of selection was about minus 35, so 2 any mu is minus 35. The fraction which are neutral is about 17%, and about 8% were beneficial, and among the beneficial, the scale strength of selection, 2NES, was a little bit under 300. So a similar analysis in Drosophila found that about 2% of all the replacement mutations were adaptive, but with much weaker selection. So if you recall back to the argument about sweeps, strong or weak, we were able to basically estimate um, from previous results, lambda, a rate of adaptive substitutions. The other unknown we need to get at is gamma, the average strength of those substitutions. So that discussion I gave you 
on sweeps, we talked about a many or few, well, many or few is the, the lambda, the rate at which they occur, and the strength then is given by gamma. We can basically estimate those quantities from using McDonald Kreitman type data. We estimate gamma using Poisson random fields. We can estimate uh, lambda by knowing estimates of alpha, for example. So we can then, an obvious question is how does the, this number, how does that relate to a fraction adapted substitutions? Let's look at something. So for this human data, 8% were adaptive with this value. So what do you think that translates into in terms of alpha? Well, as we'll see, that translates into an alpha of almost 90%. Why? Well, this class doesn't enter. This mutation rate is much, much higher than that, but these have a much higher, so this, more neutral mutations appear than beneficial, but the beneficial mutations have a much higher chance of being fixed. Remember, this is a set of genes which was specifically chosen because of prior evidence of selection. So it's an inflated sample, but usually put those together. So what's the rate of adaptive substitutions? Well, here's the rate at which new mutations arise. We've got two N copies. Mu is the overall mutation rate. So mu times PB, that's the mutation rate for advantageous. That's the number of advantageous mutations arising each generation. The chance that an advantageous mutation is fixed, given this interest of a single copy, is a classic result. It's 2s, and this is a correction when you have the effective population size is different. And if you work that out, you get this result here. It's simply 2 gamma, which we know, times the probability of being a new beneficial times mu. So alpha, the rate of adaptive substitution, uh, the fraction adaptive substitution is the fraction, the, the rate at which adaptive substitutions occur divided by the total rate. The total rate is adaptive substitution plus neutral substitutions. You plug that in, and this is the expression here that connects the parameters. The fraction adaptive substitution equals the average strength of selection from the Poisson random field, and then the ratio of the estimated uh, neutral to beneficial mutations. In Poisson random field. When you plug that in, you get in this example, the adaptive substitution rate is almost 100%. So every one of those mutations you see, replacements in that small data set, were adaptive. Now, again, it's a, it's a very biased set, kind of chosen to make the point. But the key feature here is even though 8% looks kind of small, what you need to look at is not 8%. You need to look at what fraction of neutral plus beneficial, because this large fraction here never gets fixed. And even though this is over twice as large as that, these get fixed at a much lower rate. The bigger this number, the faster those get fixed. And the net result when you put all those together is the fraction alpha is quite high. So we can relate these two different estimators, an alpha estimator from McDonald Kreitman and an estimator based upon gamma and these proportions of neutral and beneficial from Poisson random fields. And we can tie these different estimators for adaptation together. You can take the Schneider results I showed you before, where the adaptive rate was about 2%. Um, if you imagine that everything else was neutral, it's probably an overestimate, we can still put it in there, and take their gamma of about 10, you then get out, you get a corresponding alpha at about 0.23. If you assume that 50% of the new mutations are deleterious, then you get a result of about 0.4. The key point, key point, alpha can be quite substantial even when the probability of being beneficial is very small. Because even though they occur rarely, they have a very high chance of becoming fixed, whereas a neutral mutation occurs, it's got a tiny chance of becoming fixed. And the key part here, we've got these two different ways McDonald Kreitman, where you basically estimate alpha. Poisson random field, where you basically estimate gamma, and then fraction adaptive and fraction non-adaptive mutations. And you can connect them this way. No questions so far. We're going to come back and connect all this, by the way, to omega, the Ka to Ks ratios that later on. And again, as 
always for this course, don't worry about the details of the steps. You can go through the notes and look those up, look those up in the book. The key thing is to keep the big picture, and the big picture is with pretty straightforward data, polymorphism divergence data, we can actually estimate parameters of adaptive evolution and ask for this data what fraction of replacements seem to be adaptive. There are issues surrounding that, but you can understand the basic logic. So um, here's Doris's estimator. So you can also take this same data. If I know lambda and if I know gamma, I can then ask what is the rate, the rate at which beneficial mutations arise. So we have lots of things we can get a handle on. The average strength of selection, the rate at which adaptation arises. Likewise, we can ask what fraction of mutations are beneficial. So let's look at what differences there are between Poisson Random Field and McDonald Crichton. Because they estimate different things, but there are also some subtleties. So a critical difference is um, the contribution is in how silent site information is contributed. So in a Poisson random field, positive selection is only estimated through this parameter gamma. If you look at the equations for gamma down here, what you basically see is they don't involve this at all. So in the Poisson random field model, you ignore information on silent sites. And because of that, you've got a much more dependency on demography. So the way to think about it is Poisson random field is more close to an HKA type of test where they're very much dependent upon demography, whereas McDonald Kreitman takes that away. So um, estimates of gamma in Poisson random field only arise through divergence data and polymorphism data for non synonymous changes. Data from silent site doesn't enter. As a consequence, the control of demographic effects on the polymorphism in non-synonymous divided by synonymous does not enter, and under or overinflated estimates from population structure can significantly bias estimates of gamma. Furthermore, it's an equilibrium model. So Poisson random field model is a bit more delicate in the assumption you require to basically go through it. Um, both MK and Poisson random fields face bias and differences in population size between divergence and polymorphism phase, Poisson random field has an additional bias in that if the population is not in equilibrium, you don't account for that when constructing the polymorphism data, whereas McDonald's Titan data do. So that's kind of your basic Poisson random field, alpha fraction adaptive substitutions, gamma strength of selection. Let me then see how we can expand that Poisson random field to get more general models. And, and Bustamante and, and Hartle and Sawyer were the ones that sort of did this. But we're moving on. Questions? Late in the day, a lot of integrals flying around. All the fun stuff. I know you're getting really excited. Okay. So here's your 10 second introduction to Bayesian methods. It can be rather long. Once again, I will just simply you know, it's like citing the Bible, I guess. Look at Appendix 2 for Bayesian methods and Appendix 3 for Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. But the basic idea is what we want to do is we have some prior assumption about where the true value is. I'm trying to get a mean. So that some prior assumption could simply be, oh, it's uniform over some area. I have no idea. Or it could be it's normal and it's more likely here, but it, there's some lesser chances out there. I've got some prior information about where a parameter is, then I do the data. And what I do is I have the data and I construct the likelihood of the data given theta and this product with a cost, with a normalizing constant, so it integrates to one as a proper probability distribution, then gives me what's called the posterior, which is the updated certainty about where the parameter is given the data. This basically is an extension of likelihood. There's likelihood. If you put a flat prior on there, the posterior of this, uh, the, the mode of the posterior with a flat prior equals the likelihood. 
these things can get computate can get analytically extremely complicated. And the reason that Bayesian methods only took off around the mid-90s is people figured out how to very efficiently compute these. And the way to think about it is Markov chain Monte Carlo is a general set of methods that basically allows you to do simulation through the following. You've got a big giant calculator. Every time you press a button on the calculator, it generates a random draw from this. And I've listed this as one variable. If I made that bold, this could be a vector of 100 or 200 different variables. Each push that button on the calculator spits out a random draw with those 200 different parameters in there. If you push that button enough times, you construct a histogram and therefore basically ask any questions you want about this without knowing its analytic form. And that's what Markov chain Monte Carlo methods do. One of the powerful things about Bayesian methods is they can solve problems that no other approach can solve because they can handle very high dimensional data sets, what we call large n, sorry, large p small n, so I can estimate many more parameters than I have observations. That's because you borrow information from across observations. And so a lot of the uh, analysis methods in genomics have moved to Bayesian. It's extremely flexible framework for dealing with complex models. That's your one side introduction to Bayesian methods. That says the same thing. So how do I extend this basic model? The basic Poisson random field model is I have a gene. I have a new mutation. That new mutation, all new mutations at that gene have the same selection coefficient, therefore they have the same gamma. That's better than assuming no selection, but it's a really crappy model, right? So Bayesian methods say we have the following. You have a gene, that gene has a specific average value, but each new mutation is a random draw from this distribution, and that distribution could either be common mean and common variance over all sites, or I could modify that to have a site-specific mean and a common variance. So the idea is I replace these fixed values with distributions with very few parameters, and because I can borrow across information, I can estimate those. So when you apply that, here's a, a Bustamante paper. So what you have here is these are the open circles or the values of gamma, the distribution, of the gamma values for a series of genes in Arabidopsis, the distribution of gamma values for a series of genes in Drosophila. And what you see basically is this set of genes, on average, almost always produces deleterious mutations. Uh, and these are not distinguishable from neutral. If you look at Drosophila, this and a bunch of these little lines extend this. A, a fair fraction of the Drosophila genes basically generate alpha values which are all positive. So in Arabidopsis, a lot of the new uh, alleles that arise are deleterious. In Arabidopsis, a lot of the new alleles arise are advantageous, at least just for this sample of genes they've, they've looked at. And so we can sort of look at that kind of analysis. So Sawyer applied this model to 91 genes from an African population melanogaster using simulans as an outgroup to assess divergence. Um, we found, after ignoring strong deleterious mutations, we found that about 95% of new replacement mutations are slightly deleterious. That is, their gammas were, again, that scale strength of selection were less than zero. And they estimated that 70% of all replacement polymorphisms were also deleterious. Conversely, they said that 95% of the fixed differences were positive selection although fairly weak. So for example, 46% were expected to have a selection coefficient between 0 and 4, 85% between 0 and 8, 90% between 0 and 14. So for this data, they did indeed see positive selection driving most of the replacements, but the strength of selection was actually rather small. So finally, we can talk about how do we connect all these parameters. Let's remind us of the parameters we have so far. 
So from McDonnell Kreitman, we can get the fraction of advantageous substitutions. From phylogenies, we can look at the Ka to Ks ratio. Um, something I'm missing here is we can get the average strength of selection. Let me put that in really quickly. So these are the parameters we have. So from Poisson random field, we can basically estimate alpha. Uh, we showed how if you have a divergence time, we can, sorry, sorry, from McDonald's front, we can estimate alpha. We also showed how we can estimate the rate of adaptive substitution from McDonald's Kreitman type data. We talked about how we can estimate these two parameters here from Poisson random field. We can estimate these parameters from a phylogeny. How are these connected? We've already shown you how alpha can be expressed in terms of these parameters. We've basically shown you how you can express this in terms of those parameters. How do we then express omega in terms of these parameters? So basically, here's kind of an overview. Here's connections we, we basically have so far. Here's alpha. We can then ask what omega is. This is the estimate of what omega is in terms of these other parameters. And likewise, we can ask, it, here's an estimate of alpha in terms of values on omega and strength and weaknesses of selection. So there's several different ways we can measure these. And again, the critical point isn't the detail as you look those up. The critical point is there's several different parameters that give me indication of adaptive evolution. We can estimate those by the methods we've talked about, and we can show how they're connected. So if I give me one sub, if I give you a subset of one, you can figure out the subset of the image. And that's the overview I wanted to give you for using these methods to uh, taking divergence data and ask about strengths uh, and rates of adaptive evolution. It's an emerging field. You can obviously see there's some issues with the estimates I've thrown up. They're kind of crude, but the bottom line is at least you can estimate something. And one of the, the, the important things is if you realize you can estimate a parameter, then you can think about more clever ways to estimate it. But oftentimes the first step is realizing you can attack a problem to begin with. And so once people realize you can attack a problem to begin with, then people start working in more detail about that. And this is kind of the current state of the field. It's probably going to be changing rather dramatically. So the material in the book will probably be outdated more quickly than other sections. But this is kind of where things stand right now.